thanks for uh, coming to this talk. I'm, I'm going to ask questions, things like, can computers draw? Can computers make sculptures? So I'm Peter Hall. I'm a member of the Department of Computer Science at the University of Bath. And I'm going to talk to you about those sorts of questions. I'll show you some examples of how computers might be able to draw, might be able to sculpt, and I'll explain some of the basic techniques behind uh, how we can get computers to perform those sorts of functions. The key thing really is the use of the convergence of two areas of computer science, one called computer vision and one called computer graphics. Thinking about computer vision and computer graphics is actually quite old fashioned now. The more modern form is called visual computing. That's really what everyone talks about now rather than computer vision and or computer graphics. In Bath, we work with a lot of companies, a lot of media companies. I'm not allowed to show you the examples because they're um, subject to commercial uh, confidentiality. But we've seen in the previous talk examples of photography, but also there's games, animation, films, broadcast, art, a whole range of others uh, that benefit from this technology of visual computing. So I want to talk about two things. One is how to translate video into some kind of artwork and how to get computers to do that for themselves. And the other is how to get three-dimensional moving models of highly complicated objects out of video automatically. This is called asset capture. Now, one of the first things I want to bring out is the difference between computer vision and computer graphics, because a lot of people get confused by that, even I think my colleagues in the computer science department. Uh, so I'll just bring that out and spend a couple of slides on that issue. Computer graphics really is about starting with a, a three-dimensional model represented here by a wireframe teapot, and then it, the computer graphics is a bunch of software that turns that three-dimensional model into a two-dimensional picture. Computer vision is the opposite way around. Computer vision starts with pictures and tries to produce models out of the pictures. So they're in some sense, they're opposites of each one another. But more modern techniques have learned how to combine these, and we'll see why. But before we do that, we'll give examples of computer vision and computer graphics. Here's a computer graphics example. Somebody bothered to make the model up and then somebody bothered to write a, a ray tracing engine in this case and has produced a picture that looks remarkably like a photograph. As a very simple example of computer vision, this is a, known as a stereo pair of pictures. So the, this is from uh, Saarbrücken in Germany, a uh, group there, uh, and they're able to make a three-dimensional rendering of the three-dimensional model, in fact, uh, of this door. This, door, this model would not be regarded as an asset because it's essentially just a bunch of points. Uh, and what assets mean is that we're able to edit and change and otherwise manipulate the object. So that's the general theme. So let's get a bit more specific now. Can computers draw? Well, I think that's too general a question. I think we should make it a bit more interesting by making it a bit more specific. And we ask, can computers draw what they see? So what what does it mean to see? What, this is really why, from a, an academic perspective, uh, from a, that makes this kind of question interesting, what computers see? Well, let's start from the beginning. And <clears throat> computer vision in non-photorealistic rendering means we start with a photograph, such as this on the left-hand side, and then we get the computer to manipulate it for itself to produce some kind of artwork, such as that in the middle, and if we force it enough, that on the left. They all come from the same picture. So what's involved? How do we go about doing something like this? Well, one of the things that's different between photography and drawing is that when people draw, they draw pictures of things. In fact, they draw, they draw pictures of things that are important to them. So that means they have to focus in on elements which are important. So do we have a cursor? Yeah. 
So here, for example, here's a collection of source images that we ran up through a test. And if we don't focus on what's important, we just, just get a reproduction, really, of the same picture. But if we can somehow find what's important, uh, this is what's important to a human. So our computer programs that we write in Bath can now work out what's important to humans. And because of that, when we take a photograph like this and then turn it into artwork through or we'll get the computer to do it for us, it means it can focus in and, and bring out detail in the face where, uh, whilst suppressing detail in the rock. And you can see here, if we rendered everything with the same degree of detail, the rock would be too detailed or the face would be too blurred. So this idea of having the computer differentiate what's important from a scene uh, and what's less important is one way to get computers to understand the visual world. Another way is to try to identify actual objects. And at the heart of that is a technique called segmentation. And here you see uh, a picture of a face and a segmentation. Now, this is a coarse segmentation and this is a fine segmentation. And what we did then was to allow the computer to fit shapes. In this case, uh, collections of rectangles or triangles, and th in this case, convex hulls. And then the computer works out which is the best fitting shape. And that then allows it to draw the larger shapes first, and then the smaller shapes afterwards. But it works out, for example, for itself that the hat is best represented by this kind of shape and the little triangles for eyes. So this was these pictures were produced completely automatically by a computer. OK, personally, I'm interested in things like <coughs> drawings of or paintings by uh, Johan Miro, the Catalan artist. I also am fascinated, in fact, by children's drawings uh, and drawings from uh, uh, the cave paintings, that kind of thing. So how can we get computers to maybe, say, draw like a child? Well, here's a very broad way uh, outline of how that sort of thing can be done. The key thing, remember, is to build a model. So what we're going to do is build a model, and this model is represented here, and then that model is used to make a picture. So that's computer vision going this way and computer graphics going that way. So what's happening is that the computer gets to place disks on top of the picture. These disks cover the whole picture, and then the, once the uh, disks are placed down, they get grouped together two at a time, uh, and it builds up a, this model, which is uh, some kind of a tree. And it buried in that tree is the duck. And the computer can identify that duck. Not only the duck, but its parts. And once it's got these <coughs> the duck and its parts, it can make a rendering in a non-photorealistic way of the duck. So that's quite a complicated process, in fact. Uh, and <coughs> um, it's... Uh, uh, quite involved, but this is a, an outline of how it how it's, uh, works. And that means then we can actually get the computer to draw more like a child. So this was the same process as going from this picture to this childlike drawing. Uh, so we can get pictures, uh, computers to draw like children. And in fact, a very similar idea means that we can <coughs> get, excuse me, get computers to uh, do cubist pictures. So here we've got, in fact, combined more than one Im image at once. Uh, we can see we've got, say, for example, three faces. And we pull out pieces of that face and put them together to make a cubist picture. These ideas aren't constrained to painting. They can be extended to photography as well. <clears throat> so if you've ever taken fan, uh, photos on holiday and stuck them together in your computer to make a panorama, uh, we did something similar to that. We took a still life, uh, two very close-up pictures, stuck them together, and we get this rather distorted picture with the perspective that looks really rather wrong. But, but what we can do inside is build a, spe uh, a software camera that can't be constructed physically. Uh, and this software camera, instead of having a point as being a focal point, a uh, focal position, it has a line, a vertical line. Uh, and that means then that when you combine the pictures, uh, it's a much more natural looking way uh, uh, collection of pictures. But it, what it does mean is that the side of this book, for example, is bent. 
it's almost as if these pictures were drawn on the inside of a barrel. So the straight lines get bent, but we don't notice that very much. Uh, software cameras can be a lot more versatile than physical cameras. So far I've dealt with static objects. What about computers? Can they draw moving things? Some time ago, this was about the state of the art. So if you've seen things like Sin City and so on, that came out after this. So it flickers an awful lot. I went to um, Portugal and went, sat through a whole five or 10 minute movie about Magellan um, at one of the museums there, and that was all animated up like this. And I left the, uh, the cinema with a headache it's exactly at the right space to cause a uh, flickering rate to cause a headache. What we thought we'd do is try and solve this problem. Can we paint on video so that it doesn't flicker? And that allows things like the Sin Cities and so on to uh, happen. Not only that, we didn't want to just uh, paint on top. We want to produce the kind of stuff that animators really produce. So when you, uh, traditional two-dimensional animation uses, let's say, five different uh, forms of queue, and you'll have seen these queues without even realizing them uh, in Tom and Jerry, and you'll have seen them in the uh, Looney Tunes and so on. The augment, there's street lines, ghosting, things can look rubbery in deformation, and a particular case of that is squash and stretch where the ball here is being stretched out in its, along its uh, flight, and then when it hits something on impact it squashes and then stretches out again. And this is an example of anticipation in which animators somehow cue the motion that's going to happen before it ha uh, in advance of the actual motion happening. So then a character doesn't just start running, the character kind of winds up and then starts to run off. So we want to see if we can introduce all of these cues <coughs> into real video. And it turns out I'll, I don't have to say anything for a few minutes because we have the this. Paint box is a novel way of creating non-photorealistic animations from video. Not only can we paint coherently, but uniquely enable motion emphasis. Using real-world footage as source, our paint box encompasses many artistic effects, including advanced rotoscoping. Animators use several visual cues to emphasize motion. Perhaps the most common are streak lines and ghosting, which are examples of augmentation cues. Streak lines emphasize trajectories, whereas ghost lines emphasize speed. Animators can render these cues in a variety of styles. Densely packed ghosting lines can also serve as motion blur. These effects rely on speed and acceleration measured in a camera motion compensated sequence. Animators often combine augmentation cues with deformation cues such as squash and stretch in the direction of motion. To depict impacts, we automatically detect and analyze collisions. The system deforms objects in a cartoon-like manner. General deformations are also possible. We key on velocity to suggest drag and on acceleration for inertia. Moving objects are often occluded. Our system handles these transparently. Animators often alter timing to emphasize motion. We automatically extract articulated dolls to make this easier and alter the pose over time. Allowing common effects such as anticipation which we can incorporate with our other motion cues in the same framework. We can affect pose more generally to get effects such as Monty Python walks.
For coherent rendering, we treat the video as a volume with time as the third dimension. We partition the video into sub-volumes separated by surfaces which have been smoothed. Now we can control coherence and so reintroduce different kinds of incoherence. The system attaches rigid frames, giving a moving canvas to draw on. The motion of paint strokes is now naturally coherent. We can map painted objects onto any background. Advanced rotoscoping is also possible. Motion cues and coherent painting are integrated in our system. This example shows how cartoons can be generated using our video paint box. Okay, <clears throat> so that video came from 2004, so it's really quite old now. Many of those techniques have made it through into the mainstream industries. You'll have seen them perhaps in uh, the introduction to Match of the Day, where there was uh, street lines behind footballers and so on. Uh, but we were, the, we were the first to be able to do this. Uh, so I'll tell you very briefly about how these things are done. Uh, <clears throat> one of the first things we have to do is take the video and break it into different uh, layers. And here you'll see the front layer has got the front of the uh, uh, basket, basketball basket, and then behind that is the ball, and then behind that is the back of the basket, and behind that uh, is the uh, uh, wall. And that means we can paint on each of these, or get the computer rather, to paint on each of these layers individually. Uh, and that's when we map them back together, that's how we create the effects. If we have a more complicated object, like somebody walking down the stairs, the reason for having these markers on was so that we can split the body up into uh, pieces and make a doll. Once we've got all those things, we can, uh, th those elements, uh, we can follow the objects around the video as they move, and then we can work out uh, their trajectory, we can work out their speed, their acceleration, we know exactly what these objects are doing. We can work out the trailing edge. Once we've got the trailing edge, we can do things like add streak lines. <coughs> Without wishing to go into too much detail, streak lines are actually quite hard to add. If you just follow <coughs> um, a point on the object, like this sheep, you can end, up, can end up with these crossing uh, street lines, and that's really not what you want. It doesn't demonstrate the motion very well. Really what we want is, is the sheep is moving from left to right. We want the street lines to follow. So that's not what we want. We want something slightly different from that. And the subtleties involved with the stretching. We can't just stretch objects like the ball <coughs> in um, just stretch it out. We have to stretch out and bend it at the same time. We have to bend it along the trajectory. So here's a, a kind of a line of how we uh, add those, uh, at least anticipation effect, uh, effects. So point lines aren't, point trajectories aren't enough. You have to match correspond trailing edges. That gives us a collection of curves. We have to smooth those curves. We filter the curves and find out which are important. That's again the salience. And then using uh, by the technique of trailing circles, transparent circles along the uh, trajectories, we can paint street lines, and by fitting a curvilinear basis we can stretch the object. We can do more, we can follow the trajectories of any point, uh, and we end up with these coloured lines here for the trajectories of, for example, the elbows and the knees. One thing of interest is the trajectory of the foot. And we can automatically analyze that and work out when the foot's off the floor, when it's leaving the floor, when it's coming back on the floor, and how long it stays on the floor. <coughs> Excuse me. And that will allow us then to create uh, new, uh, or at least emulate forms of art like this, which is uh, modeled after Deschamps' New Descending the Stairs 1909. We've got many more examples of painting, but uh, we don't have the time to go into those. So instead what we'll do is we'll talk about computer vision for model acquisition.
So we've got a non-photorealistic rendered version of a tree which captured from the video. Unfortunately, I've lost the video, uh, but this was, <coughs> I can render this tree in many, many ways, including 3D. I've just chosen a non-photorealistic rendering <coughs> for this slide. So as before, we've got um, another show reel to show you. I won't show you all of it because it's, this was designed for a technical audience. In this paper, we demonstrate how 3D dynamic tree models can be made from just a single video like the one shown here. We use video as a source because it captures realistic appearance and motion. We first produce a static model using the initial video frame as a reference. Afterwards, the model is animated using motion extracted from the original video. Given one model, the system can automatically generate many unique trees of the same species. Our modeling step only needs a 2D skeleton to work. We automatically extract it from the video using off-the-shelf methods. To make a 3D skeleton, a 2D skeleton is first copied into new planes. The branches are pushed away from the planes to make a convincing 3D skeleton. Our method finds the optimal skeleton shape using a Bayesian-based approach. Once a 3D skeleton has been made, leaves can be added. Our output model matches the reference image from the front and has a natural appearance from all other angles. Next, we add motion to the model. We reconstruct motion in 3D by tracking the tree moving in the source video. The basic idea is that the 3D tree should always project onto its moving 2D skeleton, but this simple method can bend and twist branches out of shape. This problem is illustrated on the right. Our method makes sure the 3D tree moves in accordance with the video, whilst keeping its branches looking natural. We compare the results before and after our Bayesian process. Here we show the moving model alongside the reference video. One important feature of our system is it does not require new video to make a new tree. Instead, the existing model is used to populate new ones. We generate new trees first in 2D by growing them into an outline. We also make sure the bifurcation shapes in the new tree match those from the existing example tree by statistical sampling. The 2D trees are converted into 3D using our previously described Bayesian method. To make the new trees move, we extract the dominant frequencies of the swaying branches in the example. Statistical sampling is again used to make sure the tree's movement looks similar to the example. Next, we compare our results to alternative methods okay. and explain how you... I'm going to stop it there for a second. ...how user control. <clears throat> That's just comparing with everybody else um, and telling us how good it is. So I'll move that on. Close it up for a second. Conclusion. The ability to model and animate environmental features like trees is important to many interesting applications. So Our method makes the process easy and convenient. When we started this work, we uh, asked some skilled animators, and it takes a skilled animator a week to build a single tree. With us using this technique, uh, I can build a tree in about 30 seconds, provided I've got a video. So it's for me to build a tree, I go out to the real world, video my tree, draw around the tree, and I get a, a three-dimensional tree back out. We can do a bit more than that. This video shows a few examples of how you... Here we show an example of building a conifer tree from a simple 2D sketch. Okay, so we can trunk and the build different sorts of trees. In different colors. By neither copying nor pushing the central trunk during the 3D conversion, our system is able to model trees that exhibit apical dominance. Here we show the tree in motion. We work with not just the film industry, but games industries as well. So things like, for example, Our being able to draw an outline to control uh, the shape of new tree. Control the shape of things, control the resolution of the tree is very important because we have a diverse range of users. And users can balance efficiency with rendering quality by changing the complexity of the model. 
and animation control is very important to them we can control the because motion in we want to ways. be able to for example driving the tree using an audio signal of a windy day We can also make the tree dance to music. Okay, so most trees are actually controlled that you'll see in, say, uh, Avatar by blowing wind at them. We don't do it that way. If we did, we couldn't be able to make the tree dance. So we do it a different way. A gallery of results. If we can render, of course, you'd expect trees in different seasons. We can render them in watercolor or, or more like a cartoon. And we can do typery as well. So we can do a whole range of different things. So now that we can acquire these tree assets, as they're called, from these outdoors, uh, what about other assets? Because they're not the only form of natural phenomena. And it's the natural phenomena that are typically very, very hard to model. They oftentimes use uh, complicated physics, and that requires the animator to either know some physics or work with somebody that does. It takes uh, an awful long time. Can we do it? We've got this trick that reduces uh, the acquisition time from a week to 30 seconds or so. Uh, can we do something similar for other phenomena? And the next thing we worked on was water. So here we've just taken water clip from a database and we've produced a three-dimensional moving surface uh, from a single video clip of water. So we didn't have to use any physics to do this. Uh, it was just video modeling. And that's just as well because our video modeling is quite general. It can do boiling water. This would be really hard to do physically. And also hard to do physically would be turbulence like this uh, as in the case of this waterfall. So what, you know, we can get these clips of three-dimensional moving surfaces. That's not interesting by itself. But what we can do, and I can get my cursor back up, which I seem to have lost, there it is. Water scenes like this can be computationally complex and expensive as well as unintuitive for artists to produce. This is because they are usually physical simulations. Our approach uses video examples to generate water surfaces, which artists can combine to make a new scene. We start by using a standard method to get height and velocity information from each of a set of example videos. Our contribution is a method of tiling together these water surfaces in a way which allows the seams to be easily blended to make a novel animation. We will demonstrate this with the water slide animation. First, the user animates the water pool by specifying this example to be used here. Another, more turbulent example is placed overlapping it. The surfaces are blended together using this gradient. A third example water surface is placed over the top to add splash at the bottom of the slide. Here is how all three videos are blended together to produce the animated pool surface. We enhance the surface by adding a foam texture extracted from this video. In some cases, such as this slide, there won't be a video which will cover the required length. Our method allows us to extend a single sample to fill the space. Finally, the user places this waterfall example at the bottom of the slide. The surfaces are then blended together using this gradient, producing the final surface for the slide. The final scene can now be rendered. Since we have velocity as well as height information, 
we are able to use this to drive the movement of other objects. We will use this to create the effect of reed swaying with the movement of a lake. So this means that the water surface is actually behaving like a physical thing, even though it's not. And there's a couple more results I'd like you to results. just take a look at. I won't show you, show you all of this. So this was made from patches. In this case, we had to take the square patches and bend them round uh, into a donut shapes or patches of donuts. <laughs> okay, we've seen this one before, so I'll move it on. Okay. So, I've gone rather faster than I thought I would, but that doesn't matter. Uh, wrapping up. So, computer vision and computer graphics, really, uh, what I've hoped to show you here is that computers really can draw what they see. It's interesting to ask how do computers see? What can they see? But nonetheless, computers can draw from photographs. They can sculpt complicated models. Uh, and that's of real value to the creative industries here in the UK. And the visual computing, which is this combination of computer graphics and, and computer vision, I think has an especially bright future. It's one of the UK's strongest industries, so we're re really very pleased to be a part of it. Okay, I guess that's it. Are there any questions? Hi. First of all, Hi. thank you for this um, talk. It was really mind-blowing what you can do nowadays. Um, going back to your video um, toolbox or animation box, um, I'm thinking about live video. But when I think about all the effects coming from the field of systems theory, it's like, well, yes, that looks all right, doable, like first and second derivative, makes all sense. But there's this one video, this one effect, anticipation. Right. W have you given some thought about the, the meaning of that? And because that's interesting, right? Yeah. You're right to pick on anticipation, because that's the hardest uh, animation cue of all to produce. Uh, we have been able to produce anticipation. So the, we, on the metronome, we've been able to change its behavior so that it does anticipate the movement it's, it's going towards. Uh, and the, key to <coughs> the key to doing that is we have to watch the trajectory, and then we have to edit the trajectory in time instead of in space. Uh, and it's really quite complicated and involved, and that's one of the reasons I didn't show the mechanisms behind anticipation. But we can do it. Yeah. Does that answer the question? Yes. Yes. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you.